Is China's experiment with working with the West finally over? To discuss the roller coaster of relations between Chinese and Western businesses over the past four decades, I'm joined by Anne Stevenson Yang, who spent a quarter of a century working in China as an industry analyst and trade advocate, and she's actually just published a book about her experiences called Wild Ride. Thanks for being with us, Anne. And, and is, is that a good way to characterize China's relations with the West over the, the past few years as a wild ride? I th think so. It's sort of up and down, bucking like like on a bull. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the the because we hear a lot about the the downs, but let's remind ourselves of of the ups and 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 particularly in the early years of China's reopening or, or its opening, its reforms uh, were initiated in 1979. But you arrived in China. Your sort of story there starts in the mid 1980s. What was it like being a you know a foreigner in China at the time? It was super exciting, but it was also, you know, you were treated like some kind of circus animal. You know, people, I caused bicycle accidents. People would see me on the street and swivel their heads and bump into a lamppost because they were so shocked at seeing a foreigner. It was, um, you know, foreigners were unusual. It was also a very exciting time. There was lots going on in the arts. The universities were opening up. You started to have dances. Of course, men with men, women with women. But nevertheless, it was sort of, you know, interesting and new. Right. And what you're sort of getting at there is, is, is the idea of China opening up economically, right? This was the start of China's capitalist experiment, I suppose. So why, why did they see the West as, as, as bags of money, as, as you've put it? Because the in the 1980s there was a lot of concern that that uh, the in, the uh, investment by foreigners would bring in a whole lot of foreign ideas that would uh, corrupt Chinese minds, and so they they isolated foreign investment to uh, certain cities on the coast, and um, and and kept foreigners as separate as possible. But they were looking for capital investment uh, in order to drive exports and, and bring in some hard currency because China, as you know, has a soft currency that you can't use overseas. So uh, so there was a lot of interest in, in persuading foreign companies to invest in those cities on the coast. And how did they go about persuading foreigners to engage with China economically and, and, and how did we end up with the sort of boom in trade relations between China and the West? Well, initially they set up 13 open cities where they, uh, they invited foreign companies to invest uh, as long as they would export the product. So they could uh, hire people freely, or at least so they thought, they could uh, they could import their products to to export again without without taxes. Um, there were all sorts of promotional activities, or promotional policies to uh, to get them to invest. And you know the labor cost at that time was so low that uh, that that foreign companies would come in and and be like, well, you know, I can I can build my electronics products here at maybe one tenth the cost that that they're being built in uh, you know the Midwest of the U.S. And what followed was, you know, decades of extraordinary growth in the Chinese economy. Um, I, I mean, you describe in your book how the West saw China as the sort of the little nation that could at the time, and it was seen as sort of a, a, a almost a plucky underdog who was, you know, doing everything it could to make its way in the world. Um, was that the right way to see things? Do you think? I mean, that was certainly the way everybody saw things in the 1980s and even after Tiananmen a little bit in, in the 1990s because uh, Chinese officials were so eager to have foreign investment that, for example, they threw away their Mao jackets and they started to wear sports jackets uh, from the West. They built all these you know, big airports and really, really fancy hotels. So Beijing and Shanghai had some of the nicest hotels in the world. And um, you know, foreigners would come in, and they would just go to these uh, the sort of hot house districts of the of the top cities, and they would be treated really well. Any sort of tier three factory manager could get a meeting with a with a minister in China and be earnestly asked his opinion on you know what we should do about auto policy or something like that. 
Uh, the Chinese organized a lot of delegations to go overseas and and sort of earnestly study foreign laws. So so I think it was reasonable that many in the West thought that China is like trying to remake its whole legal system and become like the West. And your experience of what it was like for Chinese people at this time, when obviously things were very different for foreigners in China, I mean, what was it like for, 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 for the, you know, the general public? It was also much, much better for the general public because you have to remember they were coming out of this very, very poor and repressive period of, of Maoism um, when, you know, you could barely scrape together enough to eat. In fact, there were three years when, when you couldn't even do that. Um, and so all of a sudden in the, uh, in the 1990, 1980s first, you had this explosion of organizations. So, for example, in, in the press, which uh, is, a, is an industry that, that I was in, um, you, you, you originally had, I think, 180 newspapers. And then just three years later, you had something like 1,800 magazines multiplied also by a factor of, of, of 100 or so, TV stations and so forth. And you originally, back when you had um, sort of... Um, uh, you know, just a dozen newspapers or, or magazines, you would have one regulator per to, to read the content and, and censor it. And of course, the bureaucracies couldn't keep up with that. So there was this great sense of, of freedom where, uh, where people weren't like looking over your shoulder anymore. Um, and that was part of what created this, uh, this sort of explosion and efflorescence of the arts. That sounds very different to what we're used to hearing about China now. Yeah, well, what happened was, uh, the, the first thing that happened was the Tiananmen protest because all of this freedom uh, led to demands for a better life. Uh, people got very unhappy with the level of, of inflation uh, that was going on in Beijing in, in across China because of the uh, the reforms. And so they protested and basically every single person joined the protests and the, the leadership of the Communist Party got very anxious about this. It happened at the same time that uh, Gorbachev was visiting Beijing and uh, and, and also around the same time that the Soviet Union was cracking up. So, so at first, uh, the, the, the leadership repressed the protests, and then they embarked on a series of, of um, you might say, reforms, or you might say strengthening central control so that this wouldn't happen again and they wouldn't see the fate of the Soviet republics. So they, they sort of increased central control over all of the local governments and all of the local bureaucracies, and it became much less free uh, during the 1990s. But there was a tremendous amount of capital that was still going into the economy, so people didn't, uh, didn't feel it so much. That, and that sort of kept on through the first, you know, the, the next two decades until we came up to the Olympics and then the global financial crisis of 2008-9. And all throughout that period, how were China's relations with elsewhere, and particularly trade relations between China and, and the West? Well, you know, China entered the uh, WTO in 2001, and so uh, international uh, other countries had great hopes for China's integration into the international system. I think that that basically foreign elites were then fooling themselves about the nature of the Chinese system because they were all investing in China, they were they were deriving profits from China, they had great hopes for for the future in China, and they thought that chi that they could integrate China with the world system and everything would move on very happily. And that, of course, didn't happen. You started your own businesses in China while you were there, during the sort of quarter of a century that you were there. What was that like? How easy was that to do as an outsider? Well, it depends on what sector you're in. My newspaper business was highly regulated and very fraught, and we spent... Uh, I spent a ton of time just dealing with uh, regulatory attacks. Later, when I started a software company, it was much easier because uh, the government encourages software. Um, it was not so easy to sell it to Chinese organizations, which didn't really see the need, but, um, but it wasn't as, as fraught in a regulatory sense.
And what about now? If you would you would you try such an endeavor now? Could you try such an endeavor now? I would not, because uh, because first of all, it's much more dangerous for uh, for foreigners to be in China because you can really never tell when there's going to be some sort of uh, lawsuit or attack on you, and uh, and you could you could end up detained or, uh, or 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 barred from leaving the country for years at a time. Um, it's also a much more difficult and confusing uh, business scene and more difficult to set up individual organizations. So it's not something I would do now. Is that one of the reasons why we are, it would appear, I mean, we have the decoupling that is to some extent driven by, by political relations between the West and China, but we're also seeing a reduction in direct foreign investment into China from the West and elsewhere. Is that a result of the, the business environment in China or, or is that really all sort of the, 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 the macro political situation? I think it's two things. Uh, one is is a reduction in confidence in China by direct foreign investors. So uh, they've they've sort of woken up and realized that they have too much risk if they have a huge portion of their production in China. So you see companies like Apple and you know other major manufacturers uh, shifting so that they have more facilities in India and Vietnam and Malaysia and other places like that. The other piece of it is that um, is the matter macro environment. So, so uh, portfolio money has shifted away from developing countries because, because of interest rates fundamentally. Um, and so there's, there's a whole lot less, you know, in, in the past when, when money was, was sloshing around the world seeking yield, um, people looked for growth, they didn't look for profit. So, so China looked like it was growing and it didn't really matter whether uh, you were going to get some of the profits from those companies, you just poured money into them. You mentioned in, um, in Wild Ride, in your book, that there's a fear surrounding China as a competitor and, and, and the relationship between Europe and the US and China is, is more adversarial than it, perhaps than it's, than it's ever, ever been, certainly in terms of, of trade. But you say that, that that fear of China is misplaced. I mean, why do you say that's misplaced? Yeah, this is something where the the West has kind of flip flopped between um, between thinking China is you know a sweet sort of little panda bear younger brother type of uh, country that's just aspiring to be like us, and then uh, all of a sudden worrying that it's it's a wolf at the door. Um, and I think that neither is really true. I think that the Chinese leadership has demonstrated that its key interest is in staying in power and accessing uh, international energy resources um, and in, you know, basically in being left alone. Um, and China has, you know, the, the, the previous wave of of worry about China, which was very, very big in the early 2000s, was that China was going to be a huge tech competitor and basically eat the lunch of international firms. That hasn't happened, and I think that there are structural reasons why that cannot happen. What sort of structural reasons? Well, in China, the 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 government directs uh, company activity and uh, subsidizes company activity, and all of the incentives are are toward uh, replicating existing international technologies rather than creating new technologies. And so companies may do that and may drive down the price, but in the end, it's it, it creates value destruction. It doesn't create new technologies, and and they never get on top of the of the innovation curve. These companies. So it's yeah. fundamentally a problem with the way, you know, the planned economy. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, what's Beijing's view on trade with the West now? Because I've talked about, you know, how the, the attitudes to, in Europe and, and the US have changed towards trading with China. But, but Beijing obviously has its own problems at home now that the, the economy isn't growing and to the same extent that it it's been used to for the past few decades. It has problems in its real estate sector, for example. So how is that affecting how much Beijing wants to trade with the rest of the world? 
So Beijing, of course, would like to maintain uh, good trade rela relations with the rest of the world, but it's not the, the the Deus ex machina that it was in the in the early 1980s when China just had no foreign currency and had to figure out a way to to create exports. Now they have uh, bigger fish to fry, and the biggest fish that they have to fry is domestic debt. So they they have spent. 40 odd years uh, driving economic growth with capital investment that's less and less remunerative and, and productive. And so they've built up a big mountain of debt that uh, it, it's hard to say how much the unpayable debt is, but I think it's safe to say it's a good you know, 40, 50% of GDP. And the, the central government is clearly very concerned about this. Um, and they kind of flop back and forth, or, or let's say, you know, sort of pace in a cage. Uh, and the cage on one side has, um, has, has the currency where if you were to, to, you know, just issue a whole lot of new renminbi to pay the old debt, then it would crush the currency. And crushing the currency would, would crush domestic confidence in, in the government and uh, trade and all sorts of things. You know, it would make imports very costly, for example. But on the other side, you have this, uh, th this need to drive growth and driving growth requires capital investment. So so they kind of, you know, pace back and forth between remedies. And one remedy is, oh, okay, let's let's put some more money into the economy. And the other remedy is, oh, let's limit debt. So they really don't know what to do. Something that I think perhaps speaks to the climate in China, particularly the attitude towards foreigners, is, is the reason that you haven't been back there for, for, for what, five years, which you have spoken about. It's better that you explain why that is than, than I do. But why is it that you've not gone back to China yourself, despite having in the past had such close business ties there? Well, I mean, back in, in the 1980s and 90s, the central government had, had a whole lot of sway over, over local governments and authorities. Now it's a, it's a bigger, more developed, more chaotic place. And it's really hard to tell who might come out of the woodwork. And, and what happens is that um, all you really need is for one company in China to bring a a lawsuit, whether it has merit or not, you won't necessarily know about it. And then if the lawsuit is brought against you or your organization, you won't be permitted to leave China until it's uh, it's resolved. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm not really concerned about the high level politics. You know, somebody at the polit at the Politburo saying, oh, and Stevens and Young doesn't like China. You know, I, I just don't think I'm a big enough fish for that. But I'm worried about the little stuff. If we talk about the roller coaster ride of, of relations, is there any chance of um, relations improving anytime soon and, and perhaps you being in a position to, to return there um, free of the concerns that you have? You know, it, it, it seems to me that if, if I were the Communist Party, the only path left to me in order to stay in power, which is clearly what they want to do, would be to become more repressive, to, to let fewer people in and out of China and to, um, and, and to you know, talk more about national security. So to the extent that that happens, I'm not going there. OK, and Stevenson Yang. Uh, thank you so much for speaking to us, author of A Wild Ride. Um, thank you very much for joining us here on DW.